Hello, everyone. I can see people joining, so I'm just give, going to give everyone a few minutes for you to join. I can see some familiar names from this week joining in. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, people coming in. Okay, it's now time for us to start. So, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Startup Fest, a series of events brought to you by City Ventures. Uh, I'm aware that this is the first week of school for many of you, so welcome in uh, and make yourself comfortable. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Rui, and I work at, at City Ventures. Uh, some of you might know what City Ventures is already, but if you don't, want, want, if you don't know what City Ventures is, we, we are the driving force for entrepreneurship at City University of, of London. Uh, we are a small team, and we're proud to say that we support student entrepreneurs. So if you are a student at City, and if you think that you have a business idea, or if you think you want to establish a business, we are the team that you should be talking to. Uh, like I said, we are a small team, but through a number of events like this one, competitions and programs will help you going from idea to, to business. Uh, we are right at the heart of the Silicon Roundabout. Uh, the EC, EC1, the postcode, is the heart of the London Tech City, and we are proud to have supported throughout the years around 350 company, companies. We have raised over three uh, 30 million in investment and we have created more than a thousand uh, thousand jobs uh, part of our offer is the launch lab and the launch lab is right in the heart of the tech city as well uh, this is an awesome uh, working space and with this if you launch your business you will be able to join other city entrepreneurs some of them are featured on the on, on, the, on the photos on the left and we can help you to grow your business through our accelerator program to help you achieve some of these things and help you turn your idea into, into a business, we have put together a number of ebooks. So if you have your smartphone with you at the moment, just hit that QR code that you see on the screen and you can download uh, those three ebooks entirely for free. Uh, well, you can choose to download one, you can choose to download the three of them, and they really help you to get uh, around your, your idea and hopefully turning it into, into a business. Uh, we, we think that the best time to start a business is now, uh, pandemic or non-pandemic. Uh, this is really when we want our students to feel empowered and encouraged to, to start a business. And for that reason, we also put together an uh, online course through Udemy. If, again, you use the QR code that you see on the screen, that will take you to the page where you can register for the Udemy course and find a few learnings about starting and launching your, your business. If, on the other hand, you fancy a chat with me or someone else from the team about your business idea, we offer on a weekly basis one-to-one -one appointment for students like, like yourself, so recent graduates. So a thing to do or things to do, again, use the QR code. Uh, at the end, I will share my, my email address as well. And you, from there, you can book an appointment to come and see one of us. Ooh, next slide. Uh, we are on Instagram as like any other cool company. So you can follow us on City Uni Ventures. We are also on LinkedIn. Uh, the email address that you can email me on is cityventures at city.ac.uk. And if you want to find out more about the things that we do, how can we help you? You just go to www.cityventures.co.uk. So this week, and I've seen some familiar names coming, coming through as an attendees, and it's good to see so many of you coming back. Uh, we have put together a series of, of events. So last, last uh, Monday, we had the, the student panel with Brandon, Victoria, and Maggie, how to become a student entrepreneur. This session has been recorded, and this session will be made uh, available to you as a student through our, uh, through our website. The video hasn't been uploaded yet to YouTube, but once it's done, you'll get an email from us to let you know. And tomorrow, things to do. Do not forget to attend the City Spark and final. I know that a lot of you might, have, might not have started the business yet, but this is one of the biggest competitions that we have at City. And we are giving away a, 20, a prize pot of £25,000 to 10 students battling to win a portion of that, that prize pot. Uh, you see from the picture that Bubble Mine, yeah, I mean, uh, a computer science student has, has been awarded with £5,000 to 
to, to launch his, his business. If you haven't booked, again, use the QR code and join us tomorrow for the Cities Park Grand Final. Today, and part of your to-do list is how to start a business with innovation. And we have Chris Parton, the founder of Shazam, in person. He's tuning in from sunny California. Chris, are you there? Chris? I am here. Yeah, hello. Chris, I'm just asking our attendees to put their hands together and welcome you to the stage. So, Chris. Wow, look at all the people that are here. It's amazing. <laughs> How are you doing, Chris? I'm really good. And yourself? Not too bad, not too bad. I know that we just spoke just before the events. I know it's nice and sunny in, in California. Where are you calling us from? Am I right? Yes, I'm uh, just, just north of San Francisco. Yeah. And it's around 10 o'clock, if I'm not mistaken there? Uh, yeah, just past 10 o'clock. Yeah, good in the evening, morning. Good evening to us and good morning to you, of course. So, Chris, uh, I'm just going to read a little bio about yourself so I can introduce you to people. And I have just a few small questions before we jump into your keynote, if that's okay. So, Chris is a technology entrepreneur and is the mastermind behind the internationally successful music app Shazam. I'm sure that everyone uh, in the event today has heard of. This is a company he founded in 2000, and he was the CEO for 18 years. Under Chris' leadership, Shazam became a global leader and one of the most popular apps to date, downloaded by over 1 billion people. Uh, wow, Chris. Uh, having held senior positions from some of the biggest tech companies, uh, including Google, Chris has always been at the forefront of this digital and innovation uh, progress, if you like. Uh, and, and with more than two decades of first-hand experience, Chris now educates audiences like ourselves on innovation, digital disruption, and creative persist persistence. And this is what we're hoping with this uh, energetic keynote that is going to de deliver today. So with, with that intro, Chris, uh, before and before we get to your journey, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the place where you grew up, what was family like, what interests did you have when you were a, a young student? Oh, yeah, let's see. Well, um, so I actually, although I'm American, I have a, uh, I have a British father and a French mother. Um, and uh, so I did my studies uh, for my undergraduate university at UC Berkeley here in California. Uh, and then immediately afterward graduating, I went out to the UK and did a master's degree at Cambridge in finance um, and had my first career out in London as well. My first job uh, was in the center of London and management consulting. Um, so I've lived in London. Uh, I think I've moved to London about three or four times in total. I just love London. Uh, and um, and uh, I've spent a, a cumulative total of, I think, four or five years altogether over there. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's sort of a little brief background for you. Mm -hmm. And in terms of in terms of interests uh, that you had maybe as a student or maybe even as a younger student, what kind of things were you into? Comics, tech stuff, uh, I don't know, outdoors, indoors? <laughs> uh, let's see. Gosh. Uh, well, I grew up. I grew up surfing because I grew up in San Diego. Oh, okay. Uh, so that, that was my sport, and it, it wasn't a lot of good surfing in, in central London. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, but I did actually make an occasional trip down to Devon uh, to do that, mm -hmm. uh, or, or to Biarritz. That was one of my favorites to jump on a plane down to Biarritz in France. Um, but uh, yeah, gosh. I mean, I have. Uh, I, I I sort of I love. In terms of interest, I just love to um, sort of, I love socializing with friends. I love when exploring and traveling. I did a lot of traveling um, and um, I love kind of creating things and taking on different projects. And, mm. uh, you know, it could be, it could be anything. It could be uh, making a, making an amateur uh, video uh, or it could be, um, uh, you know, gosh, I can't even think of it. I always ha seem to have some project up my sleeve. Um, so that you could you could say they're a little bit like startup companies um, mm -hmm. in the sense that you come up with an idea and then you're like I really have this vision I want to create. Um, so yeah. Okay. Okay. Now we have to check your videos in Biarritz, just killing the waves. <laughs> <after> <laughs> the uh, Chris, last question for me: uh, What kind of entrepreneur do you think you are? Are you a thinker? Are you a maker? Are you a fixer? Are you a combination of those three? What defines you best? Oh gosh, I didn't. I didn't realize we had those categories. Uh, uh, I, I guess I. Um, 
I think I, I, uh, I am a, I like to think that I, I sort of have a vision and then I, and I have, of where I, where I think I want to be or where I want something, some kind of creation to be. Um, and, um, and I, and I apply a lot of follow through a lot of persistence. Um, I just won't give up uh, once I, uh, once I uh, identify what my vision is. Um, so. Okay. So, so a nice mix between a, a thinker and a, and a maker. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's hear from Chris now and learn more about the story of creating Shazam. Chris, thank you so much. Uh, just to our audience, please use the Q&A button to ask your questions to Chris. I'll be reading them out to Chris at the end of the session. So please, uh, at any point, use it. And Chris, thank you so much. I'll see you on the other side. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Ruby. Um, so I'll just kind of share, share my screen. Um, it looks like it's, uh, let me just give that another try. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I need to, uh, it just looks like I yeah, need to be working, should be working out, Chris. Okay, there we go. Um, it's coming up. Yeah. Okay. Do we all have a blue screen? Yeah. Okay. You can see it. All right. So uh, I thought today um, I love to, uh, to tell the story of Shazam because I think it's uh, uh, the creation of Shazam, um, but it really has uh, it makes for a great story in terms of the things that we had to overcome. And so many of those things truly seemed impossible. Um, and uh, we also had some lessons as, as entrepreneurs that uh, they came out of for that experience. Um, but one thing that I think is interesting for this audience is uh, that um, when 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 we began this journey, when we came up uh, with, when I say we, there were four co-founders of Shazam, um, and uh, I was the the original CEO and um, and pulled together the other three co-founders uh, to to create this company. Um, but when we did this, um, I, and we kind of embarked on it, and when I actually came up with the idea for it, I was actually a, a student at in London, um, and uh, and we embarked on it, and we actually got started in London. So Shazam's um, roots and its first office and everything was in central London, in fact, on Warder Street in Soho. Um, so uh, that was a while back, um, but uh, this is the story. Just a little background on Shazam. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, started in London in, in the year 2000 uh, with a total of four co-founders. Co um, and we've had over well over a billion users since launch. In fact, that number was announced quite a few years ago. Um, and uh, in total, we raised $140 million in venture capital financing. Uh, and then uh, our grand finale was that Shazam was acquired uh, by Apple in September of 2018. So now it's wholly owned by Apple and run as a, its own separate brand uh, with it by, by Apple. Um, at the bottom you hear, you see a, a quote. Uh, this is a, a, one of my favorites is when, when we were uh, pitching to venture capitalists uh, and we showed our demo to one venture capitalist uh, in London, uh, who was quite a prominent venture capitalist at quite a prominent firm. And after he saw the demo, he said, I don't see why anyone would ever use this. Um, so that was a very motivating uh, comment for us. Uh, we had to prove him wrong. Here you can see um, I am with two of my co-founders. Uh, in, in total, there were four of us. Um, and um, you have me on the left uh, and then Philippe, who's from Belgium in the middle, uh, and then Diraj, who's sort of from all over the world. Uh, he's lived in uh, France and Greece and Japan, and he, and he currently lives in London, um, and he's on the right. And there we are in Hyde Park. Uh, and this is the point in time when we were uh, going through um, our brainstorming exercises, trying to think, you know, we, we knew we all wanted to start a company together. Um, and we had a few different ideas that we were uh, evaluating. And we would actually have, meet in cafes in central London um, and just sort of brainstorm ideas and write them down and then sort of evaluate them, uh, critique them, and decide whether they were worthwhile uh, kind of pursuing further. Uh, so we did uh, kind of we did start from saying we're going to start a company. Here we are. We thought it was a perfect timing because we're students, um, and so it just seemed like a great time to start a business. Um, and by the way, not, I think it was a great time not only because we were students and therefore um, you know we had the opportunity to to start investing some time in a startup, um, but also because you know times were actually really tough then. The dot com bubble had just popped, um, and uh, and so. Um, it was uh, it was it was kind of it was it was tough times, and so sometimes tough times can be great times to start a company. 
So the idea um, for Shazam, I think it, it had its roots in an experience that I've been having for years before that, where I think like many people out there, um, I would hear music and I would uh, wonder what it was. And I would hear that music in many different places. Um, could be you know at a bar or driving in a car, listening to the radio or uh, in a grocery store and so on. Um, and I would actually keep a list. I would find out what songs were playing um, and uh, to the extent that I could asking around and so on. Uh, and then I would actually keep a little running list of some of my favorite songs. Uh, and, um, and then eventually I would go find a way to get, get a hold of those songs and create my own sort of mixtapes as we called it back then um, and make miscellaneous sort of cassette tapes of, of uh, my favorite music. This is of course all pre uh, streaming and so on. So pre Spotify and Apple Music. And um, so, of course, you know, the original idea for Shazam is wouldn't it be great if we could identify songs uh, and, and actually identify it um, from a mobile phone? Um, and, uh, and, but the, you know, that idea, people often say, well, you know, how did you come up with that idea? really that idea was an idea that many, many people had. It was not really a novel idea. In fact, there were actually even multiple companies that were already trying to tackle that idea. Uh, and um, they were trying it, they were trying it in easier ways by monitoring radio, essentially. So they were monitoring radio stations and they were providing, building and providing services uh, where you would be able to say, this is the radio station I'm listening to uh, and tell me what song is playing. But of course that meant that it would only work on radio. Um, so it wouldn't work in bars and clubs and cafes and movie theaters and uh, grocery stores and uh, all the places you hear music unless it was radio. Um, and of course, the user experience was a little bit more clunky then because you had to type in a radio station. So the idea for Shazam, the real novel breakthrough idea for Shazam was, gosh, what if we could identify songs from the actual sound, the ambient sound that a microphone of your phone captures from your ambient environment? And that was a tremendously hard problem to tackle. Um, but we thought if we could invent it, it would be magical because you would just hold your phone up and it would just literally listen and identify the song. Um, and for that reason, uh, um, I wanted to call it Shazam uh, because Shazam is actually in the dictionary. It's been used, it's an exclamation um, and it means to conjure magic, to do something magical. And, uh, and in, in my mind, if you held your phone up and it just told you the name of the song in your, that you're hearing in the room, um, that really did seem like magic. And so that was, a, that was sort of the inception of the idea um, but we did have a vision that it wouldn't just be a feature, it would actually be a business. Um, and um, it would actually be sort of the entry point to an array of services uh, that all related to the music that, uh, that really moved you. And, and, and we, we, we refer to this music um, as when you heard a song that you really moved you and that you wanted to know what it was, we called that the music moment. Um, and that music moment was, it could be a different song for a different person in a different place in a different time. Um, but it was uh, uh, that moment when you're sort of just anywhere, it could even be a laundromat, uh, and you hear a song and you think, gosh, I really love this song. Um, and that was that music moment, that moment of inspiration when you think, I, I really wish I could pull out my phone and find out what it is. Um, and we imagine that it, once you did find out what that song was, then now we were be the entry point for so many things that you might want to do with it. This was our vision at the time. So you could, you know, add it to a playlist. You could uh, listen to song clips from the album, to other songs from the album. You could read the discography of the artist. Uh, you could share it with friends. Um, you could just do, you know, uh, look at the album covers. You could read the lyrics. So you could do so many things all related to the songs that really were meaningful to you. And that was our vision. However, it turned out that, you know, this was all uh, an exciting, very exciting idea. Um, but of course it had its premise all on the concept that we would be able to listen to this ambient sound collect it over the microphone of a phone and then be able to determine what that song that was. And it turned out that that was not only an incredibly difficult problem, but actually an impossible problem. Impossible in the sense that it's not like building a website where we just say, oh yeah, we'll just build this. We'll just build this service. We'll just build this app. Um, we actually had to invent 
um, a new pattern recognition technology that didn't exist. Um, and as we researched it, we found out just how hard that would be because we did research and we found that the types of people who were best equipped to invent such an algorithm were people who had, were doing PhDs in electrical engineering. And specifically within electrical engineering, their PhDs were focused on a subset of electrical engineering known as audio signal processing. Um, and we, we also found that there were a couple of institutions uh, and, and where there were some, a subset of the PhDs in electrical engineering who were very focused on music and acoustics specifically. Um, and the two centers that we found for that were Stanford, where they have a group called the Center for Computer Music and Acoustics, and at MIT, where they have what's called MIT Media Lab. And so at those two institutions, there were, there were a small handful of PhD students who were specialized specifically on doing their PhD in electrical engineering focused on audio signal processing and, and in some cases with a specific interest in music. And we approached those students and also graduates from those programs and also professors in those programs. And we, we came to them with our very secret idea and we said, we really would like to invent this technology. Um, can you just tell us how we would go about doing it? And they, what, what came back is that there was no technology that could do that. Uh, and they didn't know of any way they could, that it could be done either. Um, and the reason it was such a challenging problem in pattern recognition, it turns out, is when you combine these two challenges, noise and scale. So we had noise because you have ambient sound collected over the microphone of the phone that also includes uh, noise. Um, and then the scale, we had to then search across not just 10 songs or 100 songs or even 100,000 songs, but many, many millions of songs. Um, that became a very, very difficult problem to confidently conclude what the matching song was. We did uh, eventually find a professor at Stanford. Um, his name is Julius Smith. And, uh, and he uh, was worldwide eminent in this field of music and acoustics. So he was a professor of electrical engineering at Stanford. Um, and uh, he, had in, he was famous because he had invented the uh, algorithms behind the Yamaha synthesizers, so the, so the uh, electronic keyboards. Um, and he was very well connected to uh, the, the PhD students that had studied at Stanford and MIT and, and a small group of people around the world that had, uh, were uh, academics and PhDs um, with a focus on this specific area, uh, and he knew them all. And we had collected our own list of these people that we had found through our own research on Google, of course, um, looking at papers they had published in the area of music and acoustics technology. And we made this list and we, we sat down with him. He became an advisor to the company. He said, I have no idea how to invent this, but I love the idea. Um, and um, we showed him our list of, uh, of names. I think it was about 30 names in total we had collected. Again, all PhDs in electrical engineering focused in audio signal processing and music and acoustics out of mostly out of Stanford and MIT. Um, and we sat down with him and we said, hey, Julius, uh, we, we, we need to rank the five smartest guys because we need to approach them and try to get them to join as our fourth co-founder for the company. You can see the notes that we took from that meeting in his Palo Alto house uh, here. Um, and um, the number one ranked guy on that list was Avery Wang, who had four degrees from Stanford in mathematics, electrical engineering, a PhD from the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, and one of the brightest students that Julius had worked with, although I have to say they were all very bright. Um, and we were fortunate enough after a lunch with Avery uh, to convince him to join us, an unfunded startup company with just an idea and three business co-founders uh, to join us as the fourth co-founder and the genius technologist to help us invent this algorithm. However, the next problem was that uh, Avery also thought it was impossible. Um, he didn't know how to do it. And he actually um, really almost gave up for many, many months of trying to invent this algorithm. Um, as I said, there, there was no technology that could do this. Um, and uh, so it truly was a research and development 
uh, project for him. And Julius did contribute as well as a consultant to the company. Uh, so the two of them working together tried all kinds of things to invent this pattern recognition technology. And you can see here some of the challenges that, that we faced. Uh, so um, you have, of course, a noise itself. So not only are you collecting the music, but you're also collecting uh, background chatter of people and so on um, into the sound signal. Um, then you have voice compression. So the mobile phones um, would, uh, would compress the signals for efficiency. Uh, and, um, and, and, and that would degrade the, the quality of the signal that we were working with. Um, noise cancellation. So uh, most phones also, or all phones really, had noise cancellation technologies built into them that were uh, built to emphasize the human voice and de-emphasize all other sounds, such as music. Um, we had a poor, the quality, poor quality of speakers and stereos that where this ambient music was often coming from, and not always the best speakers. Uh, in real world environments, speed variation. Um, so DJs uh, famously like to adjust the speed of music with the, when they're playing songs um, and uh, so that they can match on with the next song they're gonna transition to. Um, and then in the case of uh, DJs that, now, that were moving from vinyl records over to uh, electronic uh, digital music, such as CDs, um, they were also able to do what's called pitch correction um, so it's a nonlinear transformation of the music. Um, not only are you therefore changing the speed, but then you're adjusting the pitch as well. Um, and so that's why, you know, if you're familiar with like a speeded up song might start to sound like the chipmunks. So you can adjust backwards uh, to, to uh, avoid that problem. Reverberation. Um, and so that's what happens in a large room, like an auditorium where you get sort of echoes. Um, and then, of course, there's all kinds of computational and statistical issues um, and, and challenges that we had to overcome, um, scaling this statistically so that we could search across huge numbers of songs and then be able to confidently say this is the matching song, computational scaling to make sure that the cost, the computational cost, the number of computers involved uh, that to run this uh, incredibly uh, broad uh, uh, search in, in, a, in a fractions of a second um, would have to be uh, would have to be worked out. Otherwise, we would never make it affordable uh, to, to conduct such a search. And then, of course, when people identify songs, they could be doing it at any point in the song. So you didn't know if it's the beginning or the end or the middle, or it could be any 10 or 15 or 20 seconds of the song. So we had to make sure you could work, we would do our matches across in the entirety of songs. Um, and then, of course, when, whenever you have pattern recognition, you always have the challenge of false positives. Um, and, um, and so trying to minimize those false positives. So to give you a sense for what we were trying to overcome, I'm just gonna play a, a little bit of music here for you. It's 15 seconds of a song. This is a nice clean song that you can hear for 15 seconds. <laughs> And uh, now what I'll do is I'll play that exact same 15 seconds as was recorded in a just real world ambient environment, like a, a pub where people are hanging out. It'll give you a sense of what we would end up hearing uh, over the microphone. <laughs> So that gives you a sense of uh, why this was such a great challenge to come up with a technology that could robustly identify a song with that type of recording, that type of uh, ambient sounds. So after months of almost giving up, one day we cracked the code, or I should say Avery and Julius cracked the code. And they came up with a, an approach that they believed and, and we found would actually work. And it was one uh, that was, with, was what's called a combinatorial hash. Um, so a, a search across what we call the feature space rather than time space. So we, what we did is we created a spectrogram and the spectrogram is like a three-dimensional graph uh, of, of, of energy peaks from the sound. Uh, and you're essentially graphing these energy peaks across two dimensions. So a total of three. Uh, dimensions in total, uh, energy peaks against frequency 
in time. Uh, and then we would, once we plotted these points of these energy peaks, um, both across frequency and time, um, we had a three-dimensional graph and we would map that graph um, of the recording where we find these salient energy peaks uh, at different frequencies and different times um, and then match them against um, an original database um, where we created this sort of mathematical description of energy peaks um, for, for every song that we could get a hold of. The combinatorial hash is an indexed approach to uh, basically uh, making the search highly efficient, much similar methods to what Google uses to search across the internet very rapidly um, and, uh, and in, in fractions of a second. So that was our uh, that was our breakthrough. It had never been done before, um, and uh, we immediately filed our patents. So we had uh, our first ac actual asset as a startup, a, a patent. Um, at this point, we still had, hadn't even raised funding. Um, so it was just uh, the four co-founders kind of uh, tinkering away with this idea. And now with this breakthrough invention and this patent file, we had something for re real that we could go out and begin to raise money. And we did raise money, but it was very challenging. Uh, we initially raised angel money, but you can see here uh, after months of, of living off of angel money, a seed round, we then had to embark on raising the money required to really build this business to commercial launch. Uh, and we needed, needed a lot for that. We needed seven and a half million dollars according to our calculations at the time, um, because we had a lot of things to do. So this was our list of venture capital firms that we were pitching to, most of them based in London. Um, and um, we pitched to well over a hundred firms in total. And it was really tough times because the dot-com bubble had just popped. Uh, and these firms were very reticent to make any further investments, particularly in consumer, uh, consumer focused uh, businesses, which were considered even more risky than business to business uh, uh, startups. So it was pretty challenging. But we ended up raising some money and embarking on our business. However, little did we know all the other challenges that we would face. And if one of them being, we were just so far ahead of our time. And this gives you perspective of where we were back in 2000, 2001. We were a year ahead of the iPod itself and iTunes which was two years away. So we were, you know, there was really no market for digital music. Um, and there was no behavior around digital music at that time. And of course, the iPhone itself, which uh, uh, eventually led to uh, the great user experiences that mobile phones ha have enabled today, um, that was seven years away. So all the types of things that we envisioned were showing album covers, um, lyrics, sharing with friends, and so on, all these uh, things that required a, a rich graphical user interface or GUI um, were things that were enabled by the iPhone, but were many, many years away um, from where we were uh, with, our, with our startup business idea. And of course, with the iPhone, what came one year after the iPhone launch in 2008 was the App Store. Um, and the App Store was critical for businesses like ours because it enabled people to go out and discover uh, discovered apps and, and, and easily acquire them or install them. Um, and, uh, and that didn't exist either. So there was no, there was no, there were no apps and there were no app stores. Um, and uh, when we got started, um, we were really having to work with very rudimentary technologies. And this truly was what we had to work with, or this was represented, re representative of what we had to work with. Um, this was the most popular phone at the time we were getting started with Shazam. Um, and we were targeting this phone and, and really all the phones that were similar from companies like Ericsson um, and Nokia and Motorola. Um, but phones were very, very basic and rudimentary at the time. Um, this, this phone, I think, had um, about 78 by 84 pixels on its screen. Um, of course, monochrome, so, um, no, so no color. Um, and um, so you couldn't do, uh, you couldn't uh, do a lot of the sophisticated things that we imagined doing. You couldn't stream music to it. There was no 3G network even at the time. Um, and you couldn't uh, download songs to it. You could download ringtones, um, but not songs. Um, and uh, you couldn't show an album cover uh, and uh, you couldn't have apps downloaded either. Um, so it was a very, very basic phone. So the way uh, 
the way that we worked on this phone and all other mobile phones uh, when we launched uh, in the UK, which was our first market, by the way, um, was that it, you would dial a four digit phone number to use Shazam. So you would actually make a phone call. You just pull out your phone, you dial the four digits that go straight down the middle of the phone, which you can see there are 2580. You dial 2580 and uh, that initiated a voice call uh, thanks to a partnership that we had with the mobile phone companies. Um, and uh, and it, the phone call, we would dial into our interactive voice response system or known as IVR. Um, and that would just simply answer the phone, an automated system. And it would say, hold your phone to the music. And then we would record about 15 seconds of sound. Um, and then we would actually just terminate the phone call. Uh, we'd run it through our, uh, our, uh, our search engine in fractions of a second. Um, and, uh, and then send a text message back to the name, sorry, back to your, to your phone, because we had your caller ID, um, and that would contain the name of the song that we identified. Um, if, if we successfully identified the song, there would be a small charge to your phone, about 50 pence, um, because that's how we made money. Um, and, uh, and that was Shazam. That's all Shazam was. It, actually, when we showed it to people, they were amazed, but it was, it was a very, very rudimentary experience compared to today. Another challenge we had is that, of course, that to build this idea, we needed a search engine, a search engine that searched across all music. Um, and in those days, there was no Amazon cloud that you could sign up for. Um, so we had to build that from scratch, much like Google did in its early days. So that meant building what's known as a Beowulf cluster of parallel processing PCs. And you can see this was the stack of PCs that we had to build from scratch. Um, and we bought all these PCs, we stacked them, um, and then we also ran, wrote software so that they would run essentially a search engine in their RAM. So within the RAM of these PCs, um, we stored what we called fingerprints or mathematical descriptions of the sound of every song. Um, and every time someone conducted a search and made a phone call, we collected the sound and then ran that search across all these PCs that uh, on which uh, resided all the fingerprints of all the music that we could get a hold of um, for our search. All built from scratch. This is all a, a startup um, working on a relatively a shoestring budget um, and having to build all this stuff from scratch for launch. And then it can't be understated the challenge of actually creating the actual database of music. You can see here a warehouse full of music CDs um, to give you perspective of how much music is out there. Um, at the time there were in Lon central London, there were two major record stores back in the days of record stores. Uh, one was Virgin Record Store and the other one was HMV where you would go to buy uh, vinyl records, cassette tapes, and CDs. If you bought one of every single CD in those stores, if you walked in on Oxford Street and literally bought one of every album that they sold, you'd have 15,000 albums or about 250,000 songs. But we decided we were going to launch with 100,000 albums or about 1.7 million songs. And, uh, and so we worked with a distributor of CDs uh, where they, they housed all the CDs that were available to the retail stores. Uh, and we had to partner with them so that we could get access to all those CDs. And then importantly, we then had to create software from scratch that would allow you to put the CDs into a computer, into a PC, and then it would take the fingerprints or mathematical descriptions of the music right off the CD. And we employed about 30 uh, teenagers, 18 year olds, um, who uh, would work uh, in eight hour shifts. And we had three eight hour shifts a day. So 24 hours a day, putting CDs into computers and then typing the name of every song, every album name, every artist, typing it all in so that we could create from scratch this database of digital music because it didn't exist. There was no pre built da database of digital music that we could just get a hold of. So we had to build it from scratch. Again, a, a scrappy startup 
uh, having to overcome each challenge, all to realize our vision of launching Shazam uh, to the to the uh, to full commercial launch. And finally, we did launch. Here you can see two of my co-founders, uh, Philippe and Diraj, celebrating at the launch party. Uh, and uh, it was very exciting. We were going to be a huge success. People were going to love Shazam, and they were going to use them uh, all over the world on every mobile phone. But of course, sometimes those dreams um, are shattered. And one thing we learned is that uh, even though you might build a very compelling uh, service, and, and it was something that, you know, when you showed Shazam to people, they loved it. Getting the message out cannot be under, understated how difficult that is. Um, and, uh, and so uh, uh, we did all types of marketing um, that included billboards and web banner ads and radio ads and so on um, with our limited marketing budget. Um, but to get the word out so that everyone would know you could identify songs on a mobile phone um, in a world where there were no app stores and people were really just doing two things with phones. They were making phone calls and sending text messages and they didn't understand that you can do other things with phones. And so to, to get that message out proved to be very challenging. Um, and we just burnt through our funds and we nearly went bankrupt. We had two rounds of layoffs. Uh, we barely survived. Um, and, uh, and we didn't get in nearly the number of users or revenue that we needed to stay uh, afloat as a business. Um, and it was extremely challenging. Um, and so we had to survive for six years. We launched in 2002. And for those six years, we had just tens of thousands or maybe low hundreds of thousands of users, um, not nearly enough users to, as I said, to, to kind of support a viable business. Uh, based on the very small revenue that we would get per user. Um, and it wasn't until 2008 when everything changed for us, because in 2008, the App Store on the iPhone launched. Um, and it, we were immediately one of the most popular apps and remained one of the most popular apps from launch. And, uh, and, and we began to grow like a hockey stick growth curve with the adoption of smartphones, both iPhone and then Android. Um, and app stores and apps and our users grow grew very quickly from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions to tens of millions. Um, and in fact, uh, when uh, when Shazam was bought by Apple, we would for years we would regularly get about eight million new users each month. So each month, just organically, without really any marketing, each month about eight million people would download Shazam. And even so, it got to the point where we reached such scale that not only did users and people, uh, all the people with mobile phones love us, but the artists themselves loved us because we were a way for them to get their new music discovered um, and uh, get their new albums and their new hit uh, songs discovered. Uh, and they would get closely involved with Shazam uh, as well. So finally, we'd become a real thing. So a few lessons that, uh, that uh, we learned um, from this whole experience. Um, one is that I, I like to say that, uh, that your co-founders are what I call your co-experiencers because uh, when you're starting a company with people, um, it's, it's not just simply about executing uh, and it's not simply about just executing and building this business, but it's about life experience. And, and the reality is that, um, most startups are not going to make it. Um, and so it's really important that whether or not your, your startup is successful, that the experience that you have um, in creating that, trying to create that business is a life experience that's meaningful to you. Because it might be your second startup or your third startup that's successful. Um, uh, but whatever, whatever it is, you want that. It's really important that that whole experience is uh, an amazing experience, um, which it really can be building a business. Um, but of course, the roots of an amazing experience come from the people that you're working with. Uh, and so uh, the experiences I had in working with these co-founders were amazing. They're friends for life. We had great times here. You can see a picture of us when we visited the Taj Mahal in India. Um, and uh, we went to Ibiza to 
to learn more about the music culture uh, together. Um, and, and we did so many things, but um, the, the, the foundation of, of finding people as your co-founders that are not only very talented, but also uh, but also very passionate and good, high integrity people that are your friends, that, that people you want to spend time with. Um, and that combination um, is such an important combination. Another learning was just how important simplicity is. But what I like to say is, uh, while I'm obsessed with simplicity, I think that many, uh, many companies um, sort of uh, they think that simplicity is just simply creating a, a nice, beautiful user experience, um, maybe some great graphic design and user experience design. Um, but I think that often the best simplicity comes from very complicated technology. So if you look at um, the simplicity of the Google search engine, it's just a box you type in, in a, type in, in a query and you get a result. But of course, what's behind that is incredibly complex algorithms and artificial intelligence. Um, that, and that allows you to have such a wonderful experience that's so simple. Um, I also, I worked at Google for about eight years after Shazam. Um, I also worked at Dropbox and, and similarly um, for Dropbox, just having a folder on your screen that you could just throw files into and it would also be in the cloud and you could modify those files and they would stay modified in the cloud through synchronization. Those types of things that Dropbox implemented as a young startup um, were phenomenally complex technical hurdles. Um, and so they built phenomenally complex technology in the interest of the outcome of simplicity for the user. And that's what led to their success. So I think that is, um, that, that, that's the simplicity that's most interesting to me um, when you can do build incredibly complex uh, solutions um, in the interest of an outcome that ends up with a simple experience for the end users. I definitely learned, and we all learned um, with Shazam, how revenue is oxygen. It's uh, what allows you to continue breathing and stay alive. Um, and uh, it's so critical to be thinking that way as a startup from day one. How are you gonna get that revenue early, as quickly as possible? Because if you run out of oxygen, well, you could have all the dreams in the world for your startup, but when the oxygen comes to an end, you're just gonna have to shut down um, and shut down the business because uh, you know you need you need you need the money and you can't keep getting it from funding. Um, so uh, you know with Shazam, we we did some uh, uh, unusual things to find revenue. We actually built a side business uh, monitoring radio stations um, and selling that data to businesses that needed information around uh, what songs were being played on the radio, and that brought in a revenue stream to help support the business. So. Uh, you know, many people uh, are not aware that Google did similar things and Google uh, actually powered the search for Yahoo and they ran basically ran Yahoo search and that's what paid their bills uh, for for those early years while they really were building their long term vision of, of a direct to consumer search engine Google.com. So um, I think, uh, you know, really trying to find that early revenue as a way to support the business in those growth years in those early years. Um, is, is such an important thing. That was a big learning for us. And what, what I call creative persistence, um, it's something that I saw at Google um, in almost everything we tried to solve. And certainly at Shazam, I think for any great startup um, and for any startup that wants to be successful, you have to be incredibly persistent, but also very creative um, in your persistence. Um, you know, one example I like to think of in Shazam was that we needed the, the latest releases of songs. So we, because it turned out that when people identify songs, well, what do what they want to identify? Often it's like a brand new song that's get released on the radio. Um, and it's a new, brand new song and everyone thinks, oh, I love that song, what is it? But those songs were actually very hard for us to get a hold of because we were a little startup and those songs were not available to anyone. They were only available to the DJs at radio stations. So the record companies would just give, send a few CDs to the DJs and they would say, you can play this brand new song, but you couldn't even buy it in the, in the local store, record store. Um, it was called, known as pre-release music. And so we had to be creative as a startup. And we actually ended up forming a relationship with a DJ in central London. Um, and, uh, and, and he would uh, uh, arrange uh, through our little informal partnership to send uh, the few CDs with the latest songs 
um, by motorcycle um, right over to our offices so we could quickly uh, fingerprint them, encode them into our database, and then throw them back on the motorcycle and send them back to the radio station so they could be played. Um, and because that was the only way for us to get a hold of those brand new releases. It's a very creative solution to, uh, to a problem since we were too small to be on the, on the radar of record companies back then. Um, and, uh, and it's that type of solution that um, is just one example of the many, many creative solutions um, that you have to come up with. And in that, as you're being so persistent to build um, your amazing business. And uh, what I like to call delight um, is, is also such a wonderful thing as a motivator, um, I think, for any business. This was the, one of the very first articles that came out when we launched Shazam on, on these basic mobile phones. Uh, and you couldn't dream of um, uh, a better way for an article to be written by a journalist when the first sentence says, I was a different person a week ago. Just one week ago, I had never heard of Shazam. And it, it was that type of delight that where we had spoke, worked so hard to build something so hard, so hard to build, but then so easy for someone to use um, and to delight end users. And, and, that, and that focus on delighting end users and delighting everyone, delighting our employees, delighting our partners, uh, and delighting the journalists and, and delighting the investors. But that focus on really delighting people um, is, is what I think ultimately uh, uh, over many, many years led to success for Shazam. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, it's such an important thing to stay focused on, um, to, to not cut corners, but really, really uh, put in the extra effort to focus on delight as your, as, as your, as your channel, as your path. Uh, to a to a great outcome, and the other uh, aspect of that path to a great outcome is, as I mentioned, is persistence. And um, as I mentioned, Shazam launched in two thousand two, but it wasn't until two thousand eight that we even hit a real hockey stick of growth. So we went through six years of nearly going bankrupt, um, and um, and even after two thousand eight, it was still years and years of of uh, trudging along trying to innovate trying to keep up uh, trying to stay ahead of the curve before apple bought shazam in 2018 um and um so i'd like to i love this mathematical formula as a representation of of that persistence so putting in just that one percent more effort every day you can see here the mathematical formula 365 days a year that little extra one percent of effort um compounds and if you compare the compounded uh, effect of it compared to just say 1% less effort, um, then uh, it's just tremendous how it builds up over time. And, and, and Shazam and the whole team uh, really did do, put in that extra effort uh, to just keep on trying to survive and trying to improve the service um, until we came up for, a, for a, a, a wonderful outcome. And so one great lesson for me, I love this quote, the greatest pleasure in life is doing what people say you cannot do. And I have to admit uh, that venture capitalist that told us that he doesn't see why anyone would ever use the service. Um, it turned out uh, years later when Apple published the most popular apps um, in the app store, um, and they were apps such as Google um, and Google Maps and uh, Skype and so on. And then of course, Shazam, um, I did have to call him. And I did have to call that venture capitalist um, and say, it turns out, or actually I sent him an email and I said, it turns out people will use this. Um, and uh, we had a good laugh. He actually came and had lunch with me. I was working at Google at the time. And, uh, and we uh, just had a good laugh about how, you know, you can't predict what's going to be popular and what's not going to be popular. But it really was motivating uh, for me to, to, when I believed so strongly in uh, the viability of this, 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 Shazam concepts that it could be something that could be used by so many people with mobile phones in the world. And it's, it really was a, a motivator to, to do what people say that we could not do. And so with that, I'd like to just finish off with this very inspirational, very old TV ad that some of you may have seen, um, but because it's so old, hopefully there's some of you that have not seen it. It's from 1997 and it's an Apple ad actually um, about that I relate to as an entrepreneur. And I think hopefully some of you as entrepreneurs um, can relate to because um, entrepreneurs are like other, uh, other people that take risks and innovators and artists and, 
and so on. Um, and then sometimes people, you feel like you're, you're kind of a, the crazy one um, because people don't necessarily believe in what you're doing, um, but that shouldn't stop you. So let's watch this little quick old TV ad. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think Rui, we, we, we might uh, be able to open up for mm -hmm. some uh, discussion, questions and so on. Yeah. Hello, Chris, can you see me back on the screen? Yeah. For some yeah. reason, I cannot see me. Uh, Chris, what an amazing story you just shared with us and what an amazing way to conclude this, this, this session. I, I, was, I was just trying to pay attention because I think I've seen this set once and I think it was Steve Jobs' voice, wasn't it? It is, yeah. It yeah. was not rated by Steve Jobs. Okay, okay. Uh, we we have a few questions coming in, uh, yeah. but I I need to highlight this. W whilst I was listening to your to your keynotes, I went on the App Store, and I'm happy to say that Shazam sits on the third position of the most popular music apps on the App Store. And it's funny that Spotify, SoundCloud, and Shazam, and the three of them all start with the letter S. So I think that even on that, Shazam was leading the way and paving the way for music apps to be named with the letter S. But what, what an amazing story. Uh, I'm just going through the, the questions now, please, to the audience, please keep them coming in. Uh, one, one of the questions that I see here that, that I think, uh, I, you touched on this early on, but I think is, is, is good if you can elaborate. Uh, what one of our attendees is asking, uh, could you please elaborate what helped you to have strong conviction to push through, even when technical people around you didn't believe in a possible solution and business viability seemed to be out of reach? So what, what made you just have this strong convi conviction to push through, even though everyone around you uh, yeah. was? Gosh, you know, I think, so, I, I think that was a just part of my natural style to be honest I, I i was i tended to be like that as a kid for for so many things um and um i you know i, I conviction is a it's sort of an, it's less of a recipe and more of a uh a sort of a i don't know just a style i guess um but i think sometimes you know it, you'll know when you have it sometimes you just have conviction about something um and uh and when you do um, despite all the people that might not agree with you, you can feel that conviction, um, and it and it's 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 very uh, it's a, it's very foundational to to who you are. So mm -hmm. okay, perseverance might be the key. Then uh, here's another interesting question. So was Shazam your first uh, and only business attempt? Uh, is it necessary to have experiences from business failures to have a successful business? Do you think? No, I don't think, I think failures are not necessary that I think there's other examples. I mean, of entrepreneurs that their first business was their successful one. Um, uh, there's many examples of that, but there's also many examples of entrepreneurs who their, their first big successful business was actually something that followed several failures. I think the main thing is not that the failures are not um, uh, like a critical component, but when they happen, they are um, a big opportunity for learnings that become a, an even greater asset um, as you embark on your next uh, your next adventure to try to something. Mm -hmm. So, so, and this is like a, a follow up, and is asked by uh, Samarta. So, thank you so much for the question. In the initial years, you said that Shazam was at the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, what made you continue 
with the idea because even from my from my findings i i could see that it was a long time from launch to revenue stage so what what made you continue with the idea you and the team of course yeah um you know i think that i just believed so strongly that you know the, in a, there'd be a, in a world where everyone had mobile phones um that uh that they would want to do things with them. I mean, it's something that, and again, keep in mind that during most of those years that this is all pre-iPhone and pre-Android. So those phones were very basic. Um, but the way I saw it is there, they were all these little devices that you had in your pocket and wherever you went. Um, I have a pet bird, by the way, in the background, so you might have heard. Um, and um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, and I just believe that people are going to want to do things with these phones more than just make phone calls and send text messages. Um, and, I, and this just seemed like a compelling thing. So many people, not everyone, but so many people loved music and had this problem of hearing songs and not knowing what they were. Um, and that, that it was that simple. I just felt like it's just to have to keep on trudging ahead uh, until uh, until we can, um, you know, solve for all the all the challenges, the technical challenges, and the discoverability and and the user experience challenges, and so on. And some, of the, in many cases, waiting for technologies to catch up, really, for our vision. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, a uh, follow up from from this, and this is from Dimitris. Thank you, Dimitris, for your question. Uh, was was your product validated uh, through market research, or was it just uh, based on the instincts of where the technology uh, would go? Because you did touch on we launched the Zam, and then Nokia was the phone, and then com comes the iPhone, and it completely changes the market for everyone. Yeah. It, um, yeah. I mean, it, look, it was ultimately an instinct thing that, as, a, as I mentioned, an instinct that if I could, if we could create um, a simple experience on a mobile phone that would, uh, would tell you what the name of a song was, it would be something that people would love once they became aware of it. Um, uh, but um, uh, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it just proved to take longer and we needed, we needed more advanced technologies to get there before we could really realize it. Um, so, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I think. Uh, and, and, and this is a question now more on, on, on uh, thinking retrospectively, starting off in London, and because some of most people in our audience would be studying in London and, and starting maybe a business in London. Uh, do you think that starting off in London was a good or bad decision? And would, it, would the Silicon Valley at the time, or maybe even now, made it e e easier for you to, to launch the ZAM? Or what do you think? It's a great question. I mean, actually, it turned out it was this was not planned by design, but, <laughs> but sort of like we were fortunate, I should say. Um, but I think that um, so there's no doubt that London was, you know, it, so it was at the time, especially at that time, you know, it was uh, and it's, uh, things are different now, but um, it was, uh, you know, less common for there to be startups and venture capital firms in London than there were in Silicon Valley. Um, but however, actually, at that time, when we were starting Shazam um, mobile phones, uh, the mobile phone industry, the most advanced markets in the world were Japan, uh, Sweden, and, and then the UK as, as a center for Europe. Um, and the United States was way behind the curve. Um, this is, you know, again, you keep in mind that Google didn't have Android, Apple did not have iPhone, um, and really the US had not really done anything in mobile phones. And it was so backwards to give you a sense, like in Europe, you could send text messages to anyone. You couldn't do that in the US at the time. You could only send text messages to people on the same mobile carrier that you were on, which was very limited. So the United States was very backwards and the venture capitalists certainly didn't understand at that time that people would use mobile phones in all these advanced ways. So they, they wouldn't have touched Shazam with a 10 foot pole uh, at the time. And um, so actually we, we by being in, the, in Europe and, and being in the UK, um, we were absolutely in the right place. And things like you know our ability to charge people per use uh, required a technology called premium SMS, which was again, only available in Europe, not available in the US at the time. So um, yeah, London was a great place, but um, it was also a lifestyle choice. So we thought how fun would it be to start a company and live in London? And, and it was. <laughs> good choice, good choice. Uh, this is slightly taking uh, one of the, I think, highlights of your presentation, Chris, is, is regarding the VC you said, the famous or infamous, who would use this software. Uh, how do you deal with this negativity and how do you, how do you keep push for, push, pushing forward? Because this can be quite disheartening, I, I, I yeah. think. Yeah. You know, it's funny, as I always, I strangely, I, I can't figure out why, but sometimes when I face those types of 
blockades um, or um, it actually motivates me more instead of less. Um, I, I feel even more invigorated and even more uh, excited to, to kind of prove them wrong. Um, actually, in that particular case where the VC said that, um, I, I have uh, great memories of that because we were sitting in his office or sitting in the conference room of that venture capital firm. Um, and right after he said, I don't see why anyone would ever use this. Um, I said, okay, well, I have an idea. Let's just step outside of this conference room and um, let's go out into the main lobby where you, I see you have about 10 or 15 employees sitting at their computers and let's just go up and ask them if they would use this. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and let's go and, and right now and let's just go ask them. Uh, and uh, it's funny because he's kind of, he was sort of caught off guard. He, he was a of an ex uh, uh, investment banker and, um, and, uh, and he was cut off guard and he kind of thought for a moment and he realized that I might be right, that actually a lot of the people might say, yeah, I would use a, a service like that. Mm -hmm. And you know what he said right then? He said, I guess he said, I, I guess I would never buy a Barbie doll, but there's a large market for Barbie dolls. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. He, he kind of admitted using the, the, Barbie, the Barbie doll. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, uh, on on slightly building the the team, and this is a very good question from Esme. Uh, so thank you for your question. What was the most difficult thing in bringing in a technical co-founder? Uh, and 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 this attendee is saying that uh, I think there's always good ideas, but finding uh, a technical a good technical co-founder is is the most difficult part. Do you have any advice on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think finding a good technical co-founder is extremely important in that early stage of a startup. Um, and um, we treated it, uh, we, get, you know, we, we did, did justice to the importance of, of that, I should say. You could argue that really all we did, and we being three co-founders looking for the fourth co-founder, you could argue that sure of 90% of everything we did for a period of two or three months was just simply finding the perfect technical co-founder. Um, that's how important it is. So it's not as simple as just go meet a couple people, um, you know, put a little ad online or, or you know, it, it, it was something that justified going all in and dropping everything else because without that, um, we had nothing. Um, and, um, and that person, you know, needs to, they need to be, share your vision, share your excitement, be willing to dive in really, um, really you know, be in a position in their own life and career to, to kind of go and co-found a company and take those risks um, that you need, they need to have the, uh, the genius and insights and, and capabilities that match with what you're um, trying to overcome and, uh, and invent or build. And, um, and then they need to have the alignment of, the, of personality and integrity and things. So there's just so many things that uh, it can't be underestimated, you know, how much time goes in, is, is, it should be justified for finding that, that perfect person. Okay, okay. Uh, Chris, I'm, I'm cautious of the time. I was wondering if you have time for maybe two, three more questions. Sure. Is that okay? Thank you so thank you so much. I think that's I, I'm looking at the, the number of questions that we have. I'm just going through them and there's some really good ones here. Astrid is asking, and thank you for the question. Uh, very inspiring journey, Chris. Thank you for sharing. Do you have any advice for finding slash choosing two founders versus doing it on your own? For One finding oh for finding for having co-founders versus going sol solo. Solo, yes. I mean, you know, I think that um there's really no right answer on that. I mean, I think, you know, there are people that go solo and it works out just fine. Um, and there's advantages to, to going solo because there's less risk of um, having a falling out or, or big differing of opinions and so on. Um, but, but there's also disadvantages that you're really having to motivate um, on your own uh, to do something. And, um, and, you know, that a lot of the motivation and, uh, can come from having sharing the experience with other people. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think there is a right answer. But but what I would say is that um, it is critical that it, when you do get co-founders, that it's people that really are going to, mm -hmm. your you know, integrity, number one, super high integrity, um, you know, that complement, they're complementary to you. So what, what they're good at is different than what you're good at. Um, and, um, and that was certainly true for each of the four co-founders of Shazam. They were all very good at different things. Um, so, uh, so there's no right answer whether or not to have co-founders. So, okay. Okay. For one from, from Miriam here, uh, Miriam, thank you for the question. Uh, and she's asking, knowing what you know now, is there anything that you would have done differently when you were first starting out? I mean, the main thing is I mentioned, you know, that revenue is oxygen and, uh, 
And I talked about how we, we built a side business um, that brought in some early revenue while we were struggling to survive. And if we hadn't done that, frankly, we would have gone bankrupt and never made it even to the point where the Apple iPhone launched. Um, so uh, I guess the, you know, hands down, what I would have done is done that even earlier than when we did it. Um, so, you know, we did it pretty early, um, we did, but I would have done it a year earlier <laughs> uh, because, you know, again, that, that the importance of having that revenue to come in uh, to pay the bills is, is, is so critical. Um, so that would be the biggest thing that I would have done differently. Um, but uh, other than that, I, I feel, um, yeah, we made a lot of um, decisions I'm, I'm quite happy with. Okay. Okay. So uh, time is really key here. Uh, last question, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, but we have so many, but uh, we, we have to close the seminar for today. Why did you choose the music industry, Chris, as opposed to any other industry that you could have jumped into? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny because people often think, oh, I must be a music fanatic or you know, <laughs> highly knowledgeable about music or a musician or something. And actually, it's none of the above, if anything. <laughs> You know, I was I was the person that you know didn't know very much about music and um, and uh, and and that's kind of why I needed this service. I was more like your average person that just liked music and you know didn't know what I was listening to, but wanted to have an, a little collection of some of those songs to play sometimes. Um, I, I, so it wasn't that I specifically looked at a bunch of industries and just said, you know, which industry should I go after? Oh, I think I'll go after music. Uh, it was really more that I was in a mode of brainstorming ideas for a business. This was one that. Um, that came across kind of just my mind as something that could be solved. Um, but really the most important thing is it's something that I, I felt like really passionate about. And, and that was such a critical thing um, because there were other businesses I considered um, that probably could have been very viable businesses. In fact, one was uh, to sell contact lenses on the internet. But I realized I just couldn't get that excited about it. I mean, I, and I, I couldn't imagine like waking up every day and working really, really hard to sell contact lenses on the internet. And it would have been a great business, but it just wouldn't have been mo that motivating for me personally. Um, and so I think that's that's the big thing is that, you know, for me, this idea of like this magical algorithm that would really just, you know, make mobile phones do things that people think couldn't even think of, um, that was really motivating to kind of create this magical experience um and uh and that that's what allowed me to kind of stay so focused on it for so long okay the last question and, and it will be for me so chris uh, imagine that i am and a lot of people in our audience are a young student in london that may or may not have a good business idea what would be the tip the advice uh what would you, what would you leave me with tonight as a tip yeah i i would say um you know, I think uh, come, try to be innovative about how to figure out whether your idea, so there's the innovative of coming up with the idea, but then the second thing is the innovative on how to figure out whether your idea is a good one. You know, is it going to be a viable business? Um, and even that, can you can come up with unique approaches to that that are just more than just simply asking people, right? It could be um, people kind of create very, very simple versions of it and put it out there so they can see what how people react I've heard of people even creating little Google ads to see if people click on uh, you know, on, on such a service uh, just to see what the click-through rate is. Um, and then they land on a landing page saying coming soon. Um, so uh, there's, there's so many ways of testing, but you know, think of ways that you can, could you test to see whether this idea you have is actually something that people really want? Because the, the goal is as soon as you can is to try to figure out is this something that really has legs before you go off and spend one or two or three years and a whole bunch of money um, trying to figure out, uh, you know, to build the service only to find out that maybe it was never really that viable. So I think being innovative in, in that is, is so important. Okay, so the, the initial, get the, the, the first stages right. Chris, uh, on behalf of the attendees and on behalf of CT and the CT Ventures, I would like to thank you so, so much for sharing this incredible insight about the, the, the story and the narrative of Shazam. Uh, I'm particularly proud of myself because like many other people in the audience, we've been using the app for so long and you actually meet one of the co-founders and hear from you uh, the ins and outs, what went right, what went wrong is, is has been an excellent opportunity uh, for me. Uh, I would just tell our attendees not to forget to attend tomorrow's City Spark and see 
incredible city students coming up with some incredible business ideas. Chris, if you are available tomorrow from six, <laughs> we have the City Spark final. And yeah, the event will be has been recorded. We will make it available and share it with, with you uh, in the next couple of, of days. Thank you so much, everyone. Chris, have a wonderful rest of the day. Pleasure talking to you. And I hope to see you in the in the next one. Thanks for having me and good luck to everyone with your startups. Thanks for Thank joining. You. Thank you so much, Chris. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.